Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of... I would like to have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. And this is episode, I think, 23 with Todd. And today we talked about a thing called Goda. Yay, Todd. Yeah, and we talked about what he's doing for movement and how he coaches people through the Goda framework online. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what do you got on you? Um, puppet fabric. We're about to make a professional puppet. We're gonna make some puppets. I thought you coached. I do coach. So does oh. Todd. Bye. 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 I'd like to have a conversation and today we really didn't have a topic. I'll just come back from camping so my brain is mush. We actually spent a night in the swag so the, the place we stayed at is one of Kat's friends places and it's not it's only half an hour away. They have this property that's on on the edge of the hill which looks down to the valley so they got their house which is off creek, they got a shed and they got a teepee set up for people who come visit. So we went down to the teepee and we let the kids sleep in the teepee and we went in the swag, had the swag open with the stars, which was cool until the huge ass moon come up and just lit everything up like crazy. But yeah, like the sleep was trash, but like, as usual, just my camping sleep is always pretty average. So I always come back with just mushy. So where we were standing before, we had no idea what we wanted to talk about, but then we figured, why don't we just talk about what we do? What are we doing for training at the moment? But you, and Goda, Goda? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the word Goda and I want to learn more about that. So surface level, what is Goda? Surface level, the key, it's a, I, I don't want to label it as this. Because uh, when you look in the world of like movement and all that, I, w- I would, on a surface level, so people could start to understand, I would call it a movement system. Mm. Um, but I... I just, I don't like the word system because I think it implies that um, it's very like closed minded and you have to do it this way because the, the, and I'll just jump right into like some of the deeper stuff um, and why it appealed to me. So where I got started with this was uh, years and years ago, five, six, seven years ago, there was a, a chiropractic friend and colleague who was posting all these things on social media and it it was movement based and he was crawling and he was doing all these different types of exercises and but i saw the way he moved and i was like man he looks like he's moving like with a lot of fluidity um and i so for about a year i bugged him i was like hey what are you doing what are you doing and finally the this one comment changed everything for me he said uh, he, I don't know if he was getting sick of me just reaching out, but he was yeah. like, listen, he was like, listen, Todd, he's like, I've been doing this for two years. And he's like, I feel like a baby in my body. Hmm. And that just like, I was like, all right, I need to check this out. So I paid for the the certification. I went, flew down to new Orleans to, to get it. And, uh, but it's so much more than just a movement system. And I think right now they are when I say they like go to itself seems to appeal more towards athletes because they're mm-hmm. seeing uh, a lot of non-contact injuries occur. We're seeing more ACL injuries, more Achilles injuries, you know, hamstring injuries, all these non-contact injuries occur and nobody has an answer for it. Everybody thinks they have an answer for, it. oh, well, maybe they're overtrained. Maybe it's the field or the, the, uh, the surface, uh, uh, turf versus, you know, grass or basketball, things like that. And I'm going to try to keep my thoughts coherent because there's a lot <laughs> like around this. Anyways, um, I think I even lost my train of thought already. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, they, they tend to gear it and more towards like athletes because there's, they're, they, they see an opportunity to help these professional athletes who make money with their body, avoid these non-contact injuries. Because we personally believe when I say we, and I'll reference, we a lot are the go-to coaches. We truly feel that we can reduce, um, a lot of these and it's not just, um, like that they're missing hamstring strength or they have an imbalances here and there, which, which they may have what we truly believe. And this is where it starts to go deep is Goda is, is called the greatest of all times at greatest of all time action. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a unique name. Um, probably branding wise doesn't stick as well, but what it's based off of is, um, a couple theories. One is that, um, we have an innate movement pattern when we're born. Mm. and i uh you know i hesitated on this at first because i was like really 
Um, because I came from the world of like, you know, exercise science and movement and all this. And it was really hard for me to like get out of that. But one of the things that, re- that one of the coaches said that really drove it home for me was like, listen, everything that you know and understand about movement is all based off of a, hu- a dead human cadaver. They, they looked at a dead human cadaver and they broke it up in the plane. Right. And then, you know, they say, okay, well, the knee just does flexion and extension and the elbow does this. And we have these words like pronation and supination and all that, but they, we weren't really looking at movement while watching people move. <laughs> and so, um, coach Gilly, the, the, he likes to, I, we call him the founder, but he didn't discover anything. What, what he, what he saw through watching tons and tons of slow motion video was um and and the populations that he looked at were the infants crawling the toddlers walking the uh the durable athletes so athletes who didn't get a non a lot of non-contact injuries the 70 to like 100 year olds that still run that 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 track race every year you know Mm. um and what he did was he said listen like when you look at all these people like they've got all these same characteristics and so he came up with these global laws now let me back up for a second before i go through laws um the the innate movement pattern okay is it, the other theory that goes with it is that the one thing that like humans do 90 percent of the time is move forward through space mm. so the the innate um, movement pattern that's like ingrained in us or that we have when we're born is forward locomotion okay so we got this like forward gear yes we have reverse gear but it's like a car we're only going to use it whenever we, you know like at certain times so the whole idea is how do we code up or make that movement, that forward, that forward movement through space, how do we make that so secure? And how do we do it in a way that, um, you know, I don't want to say how we do it in a way. There's a way that you can do it to make yourself more secure. And, and by secure, meaning that you're not going to break down with the amount of contact injuries. Um, And so when you, um, so when you look at the tape and you look at a lot of movement in slow motion, um, what coach Gilly found was that we've got these two, four, I think six global laws. Um, and the first one is going to be, we, um, when you look at like, you know, people like Ronaldo, you look at, uh, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, uh, Ed Reed, Simone Biles, they have straight feet. So we always want our feet straight and then we want them stacked in our columns. Meaning if you draw a line up from like your ankle, the inside of your ankle, it should go through your hip and it should go right up through here, through your shoulders. Now, back in like, I think the eighties or nineties, Pete Agascu, um, he had the Agascu method where he would look at you and see these asymmetries and then provide some, um, exercises to help you become more balanced based on his assessment. Hmm. Um, and so we want you in your columns. Okay. So we want your feet straight and we want you in your columns. The second is, was what inside ankle bone high. Now, uh, what this means is, uh, and I'm going to do a, a picture or so of it, but basically what it is, is, um, <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, a lot of people, when you watch them actually take a step, you'll see the, the femur, or excuse me, the tibia rotate down and in. And that's yeah, yeah. a big, that's a big problem. Because what we feel is that we need to have strong inside ankle bone high, meaning that if I'm here, you can actually see like my sock lines start to go down towards the outside. And the reason for that is because this position, even though other PTs and stuff like that will argue that, oh, well, you need to train the position that you were injured in. And we just don't believe that. Um, We believe that that's a very insecure place for your foot ankle complex to be in. Mm -hmm. because you see problems up the chain um now i told you this i I get excited yeah (laughs) the reason why this is so important to us is because when you look at every acl shred and every achilles shred the inside ankle bone started diving in okay and what that does is in an acl shred is is it locks the tibia in place okay and then because your femur is actually trying to rotate outward you get the shearing force Mm-hmm. and there goes your acl all right um the same thing happens with a lot of achilles issues is that people will step back okay you've seen this in like kevin durant things like that mm-hmm. the, their heel their heel hits the ground which let me save that for later and remind me but their heel hits the ground but their ankle is diving down and in and then there goes your achilles okay now 
The other reason we think that even being on your heels as an athlete is problematic is because we're seeing these Achilles problems, but it's also, we feel coming from training. So you're doing a lot there. What strength and conditioning coaches have taken, and I hope I'm not all over the place, um, is because here's one of the arguments. People will be like, well, you got to do cleans and you got to do these, these, all these strength things, because this is how you got to be strong. Well, the problem with that is, is um, if you really look at it, they're just taking principles. They're taking strength-based principles and applying it to, you know, this research that says, okay, well, with power cleans, you're, you're producing power and this is mm. what you need on the field. The problem with it is, is they're not looking at, um, you know, these rates of injuries that have gone up in, in non-contact injuries. And so um, I'll, I'll save that. I'll save the, the, the training and, and what you can do instead if people are interested. But let's go back to the to the main laws. So the inside ankle bone low is a bad idea. We see too many problems with that. And what happens is, is if that's happening on every step and every run, okay, and this is like your ankle diving in. Now that's like a thousand, that's a bunch of thousand reps that are going to be, you know, causing your tissue to not be in the right place and causing your joints to get loaded in a position that we don't think is right. Mm. Okay. So those are the first two laws. The second, uh, the third and fourth, they're all based on movement. So like I had said before, we, we, we've we been looking at movement from a dead human cadaver, but we haven't been looking at it from um, from a movement standpoint. So when you look at all, when you look at the babies crawling and the infants, uh, excuse me, the infants crawling and the toddlers walking and, and mm-hmm. these athletes, what happens is, is um, it's actually, you, there's energy, right? It's not just these biomechanical things, like it's energy. And so the, the third and fourth are when you land and you're in that landing phase, you're actually setting a bow. And if you, um, I think one of the more um, noticeable uh, examples of this is watching, like seeing Barry Sanders. If you watch him run, when he lands, he's got that bow shape. He might be a little bow legged, but he creates that bow shape, which is basically like if this is the leg and this is the knee, what happens is, is it points out when you land. So yeah, what yeah. I'm, what's happening? So what's happening is, is I'm loading the hip and everything like this. Okay. And then the, the, the fourth, um, rule or law is that when we leave, we need to release the energy. So now when people are running, okay, they load energy on their landing. But when you see a lot of people walk, what tends to happen is they'll land. Okay. And then when they go to leave, because the inside ankle bone drops down and in, their whole leg turns down out, like down and out. Mm. And we, and because you're transferring energy, what should happen is I land and everything goes down and out. And then when I release, I actually release transferring the energy over to the other side. Mm -hmm. So if you can watch someone from the back walk, if they're kicking their heel in when they release, that energy, you have your upper body, up, upper body energy turning this way when your lower body, lower body energy is moving the opposite direction. So now you're going to see that you're gonna, you've got energy moving in two different directions, and that's a big problem too. Hmm. So we can, um, it, it'd be better. I, I should have been prepared with uh, some videos and things like that. But anyways. Nah, it's good. Because we can that's share them. That's the third and fourth laws. Um, it's about how our body actually uh, like loads energy and releases it. Okay. And then the fifth and sixth laws are um, back chain dominant. So because of sitting and, and um, you know, just for a number of reasons, we become really weak in our back chain. So our back chain is essentially this chain that goes from your calves all the way up to the back of your neck. And we're, we're typically a lot weaker than we should be in those positions. So, um, a lot of the, the exercises are built to really get us strong in those extensors. Um, and then the sixth one is head control. So every time that you are in your landing column, so when I run or walk and I take that step, my head and upper body should rotate. Cause again, going back to the energy thing, we're loading energy to release mm. it, loading it to release it. So, um, those are the laws. Um, and, and basically the, the whole system, if you will, all the exercises are all based off of those laws. So every exercise that you do, you're either putting yourself into two bows, two corners, um, one bow, one corner, um, and you're just working on those movement patterns. Because what we believe is that because of this innate movement pattern from birth, what's happened is, is we've decoded that. 
through putting shoes on, uh, being in car seats and sitting for prolonged periods of time, sitting in your couch. We have decoded all this. And so the, the, the process of using this training system is to recode not only your tissues and your joints and the way they stack, but also you're recoding this movement pattern that we've had since birth. Okay. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, what I'm doing for training, because I do feel the best on this, is I do a combination. Of, I take strength-based principles and I apply it to how my tissues and joints are stacked. So, for example, if I'm doing like a, uh, maybe like a rear foot elevated split squat, I'm not just like just performing the movement to get the strength part of it. I'm loading my landing leg up in that bow, okay, and then applying the pressure downward, but I'm reorganizing my joints and tissue in a way that is safe and, and, and effective, not only for when I want to run and cut, so that way it reduces all those non-contact injuries, but also every step I take, I want it to be toward longevity and not towards a potential joint degeneration or breakdown. Yeah. It's kind of cool. This is, oh, well, that position of power, the way you worded it, reminds me of like the corkscrew analogy that I used to talk about a lot. You plant your foot in and then corkscrew that great torque yeah. in, the, in the leg, like a better word, was something I was taught. I think, want to be Dan John or Mike Boyle back in the day. And it just, that stuck with me forever. So it's pretty cool. It's just, the way you were talking is just seeing these things interlace with other stuff that I've learned is really gnarly. Yeah. And that's what, and that's what coach Gilly will, they'll say, listen, like there's tons of camps mm -hmm. that we feel have aspects of like what Goda is altogether. We like, uh, like foundation training, phenomenal. Yeah, with the back, yeah. Foundation yeah. training is phenomenal with the back chain stuff. Right. Um, creating mobility, decom decompressing your spine. That's mm -hmm. actually stuff we incorporate. We love foundation training. Um, uh, David Weck has some stuff about like coiling the core and, and landmine university. So if anybody had any questions about, well, if I shouldn't be doing power cleans because it puts me on my heels, what should I do? Well, I, I recommend people check out landmine university because everything that you're doing with landmine is done on the balls of your feet. Mm -hmm. And when done right, you're still, you're still producing force. You're still producing power, right? It's just done on the balls of your feet, which is where all athletes should be, right? You should just mm. be resting on your heels if that. Um, but yeah, we just feel like a lot of these people have in different camps have like a really cool piece of the puzzle. We just don't believe anybody has like put it all together because the way I think about it is there's levels to being like a GOTA. We call it GOTA 10. This is somebody who's a great mover. When you watch their slow motion movement, they have all of those global laws and they're doing them really well. Well. You know, throughout my time of rehabbing people and programming for people and even for myself, you know, the one question I always have is like, well, what what are we striving for? You know, like what what is the end goal? And I think deep down underneath it all, I think we're looking for longevity. We want to be able to do these things. We want to build strength, which is important. We want to do all this. But like, I think most of us still want to be moving when we're 80, 90 years old, you know, mm. and moving pretty well. And that's what always brings me back to the to the whole idea of like, hey, there's this movement pattern that's innate, innate in us. Okay, we we get it when we're born, and really, my in my opinion, the goal is to upcode that as much as possible. Like that's the end. Like that's the golden nugget right there. Like let's how do we get to making our bodies just move really well and manipulate energy in a very safe and effective and and um, what's the word efficient way. Um, because I think with all these other camps, I think they're just taking certain principles and they're just applying it. And it makes sense. Great. Straight strength based principles will get you strong. But what are we sacrificing if we're not paying attention to how our tissue and joints are being stacked? And that's the question that like I have with people because, you know, I just had a woman in here the other day. She's having like uh, some lateral knee pain. And I was like, listen, I don't think you have any like joint damage or, or any like cartilage damage just yet. But. I want you to pay attention to how you catch your cleans. And I can't tell people like not to do power cleans and stuff like that. But what I can do is say, if you're going to do them, let's pay attention to these things. And, and I said, listen, when you catch like your hang power clean or even whatever, like full clean, 
I was like, how is your knee? Is your, is your knee like caving in a little bit? I was like, because if your knee's caving in, let's go look at the ankle. Because if the ankle's dropping down and in, guess what it's going to do? It's going to pull the, the knee down and in. And we just don't feel like that's a, a great spot to be in, you know? And so uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But anyways, yeah. So the whole idea behind what I was sharing was I want to make sure that every step I take, everything that I do, other than sitting in here, <laughs> sitting while we're doing this, but like everything that I'm doing is, moving towards that like golden movement you know if you will and so all my training that i do is towards that and what i have done is in my own like thing is i i'll notice that people have like weak adductors uh really weak hamstrings um so what i'll do is i'll take some movements that maybe go to doesn't feel is like a part of the scheme if you will and I'll just, I'll still apply them for some people because I, if I can create like an isometric contraction and activation of that tissue and then put them back into, you know, a, a go to movement, they'll start to feel that tissue more. So I've taken what I know and understand with, with rehab and movement and, you know, all this stuff and, and, and I'll apply some of the different things to it um, because, uh, you know, I use certain assessments to determine if someone is like weak in certain areas or there's imbalances. And I just take all that information and I still tell them, I said, hey, listen, we're going to try to upcode this, but there's going to be some things that I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to program that are just going to help us get to that quicker. Um, not that you want to necessarily rush it, but um, I think that's probably the only difference I have with some of the main go to coaches is that I use a little bit of like the outside stuff to help people get to that point quicker. Um, but that's that's essentially what I'm doing. It's all, uh, from upper body, lower body. I, I make sure I stay in my back chain. I, I make sure that I, um, abide by the laws and the rules of, Glo of Gota. And the last thing I'll say to it is every time I get away from it, every time I get away from it, my body starts feeling worse. Nah. And, uh, and I'm just reminded, like, why would you, why would you move away from this? You know? So um, a lot. So what people might be asking is, what does that entail? Um, it entails uh, things from crawls to sled pushes. Uh, like I said, more landmine stuff. Um, a lot of it is uh, like isometric or wall sits and wall holds. There's different variations of things that will. Um, and you can and again, you can still use strength based, based principles to get to keep your athletes strong and, and get them stronger, all while making sure that they're durable. Hmm. Is this what, do you do like a, because there's people listening that like, oh, I want to know more, or is this like <laughs> an assessment they can do? Do you do a assessment virtually? They can't see you in person. Yeah. So if people really wanted to, um, I know you and I had talked about this, but um, mm. yeah, if they really wanted to, uh, I'm working on getting my course out. I had to delay it. But um, the first thing that I would do is just have them film themselves walking towards and away from a camera. Mm -hmm. And then if they're in a position where they feel comfortable running, some people are pretty banged up where they don't want to run, um, doing this out on the street, setting up their camera and then running away from the camera about maybe 20, 30 yards and then running back. The, the idea behind creating enough distance is because I want people to try to get up to a max speed mm -hmm. because what we find is the faster you go, the more the dysfunction shows. Um, and so for some athletes who are already good movers, I, I, I want to see them at their, their peak because I want to see what's breaking down at the peak. Cause sometimes yeah. it can be good enough movers where the walking doesn't look bad, but the running at high speed starts breaking down. And then, you know, we got to say, Hey, listen, you're really at a, you know, you're prone to tearing something here because your ankles drop in when you start to get up to speed. So she yeah, essentially she's on. Uh, shoes on are fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you're still going to see it. Um, uh, if they do the walking portion shoes off, uh, but the, the running portion, I would recommend that they put their shoes on. So let's say they do that and they do this assessment and they send it through to you. What looks, what's the next step after that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, just getting on a call and being able to discuss it. Cause I want to go through the, we, so I use like a, a on form and basically mm -hmm. what it does is it slows everything down. So frame by frame, I can actually see what's happening with each joint and tissue. Um, after that, what I would do is I would just jump on a call with them to discuss like, hey, this is what I found. 
um, this is what, and I'll show them what like a go to 10 mover looks like. And I say, this is what we're trying to go for. And then after that, if they wanted to uh, move forward with any kind of programming, then um, I just, I will go deeper into some, some of my other assessments, like strength balance and stuff like that. Cause then it'll guide me on, Hey, do I, do we need to spend more time on the right side versus the left or vice versa? Um, so I can add some extra sets and time, you know, on there. So ultimately what it looks like is getting on a call after the assessment. And then if they want to move forward, we do monthly programming. Yeah, cool. So they get, do the video, jump on and kind of like investigate what is the things they're going to play around with. And then the programming, what does that kind of look like? I know this is very loosey goosey, but I just want to give people an idea. So they yeah. get the, have the assessment with you, have a plan of attack. What does the program look like? Time commitment, all that kind of stuff. Is it a daily thing they need to work on it? Yeah, there's gonna it's gonna be daily. So the whole idea is um it we kind of I'm trying to this is something I've been working on in my mind and mm. how to express it because the the resting positions that would that we teach people, it's it's less so about a movement system and it's more about a way of life. Yeah. Um uh, yeah, because yeah. the way that the way that you, you know, when I'm home, I'm you know, I'll catch myself sitting on a couch, like relaxed. And then, you know, when I start to feel my body, I'll get down into these resting positions. So what I, what I like to teach is, Hey, these are things that you should be doing on a daily basis. Decompress your spine, get on the floor, do these movements. If you can, if you're not ready to get on the floor, then there's other things that we could do depending on what the person is. But there's going to be, a, um, things that I'm going to want you to do daily. And then there's going to be very specific like rehab programming that I want you to do based on all the other assessments. So time, time commitment, you're looking at from what I program anywhere from 30 to 30 minutes to an hour, depending on what that person has mm -hmm. available to them. Um, but ultimately what I find is when people are introduced to the GOTA, um, and it kind of overtakes your life in a good way. Uh, meaning that um, when you're in line waiting for something, you're paying attention to how your feet are stacked and how your mm -hmm. columns are stacked. So th there's a lot of things that I try to bring awareness to as well, because you don't really ever stop de like recoding um, per se. Uh, but the programming itself, it, it, depending on the, the time constraints of the person, is anywhere from 30 minutes to, to an hour a day. Yeah, cool. And then if you just sort of say like, for anyone who's listening, when you get rehab type exercises, let's just say that, that everyone's probably had those times where they're just like, I just really hate doing them, which is just something I, it's common. It's well known. Like I'll see a mate locally. He talks about it all the time. How do you get people to do shit that they don't want to do, which is the rehab. And when you work with someone using the analogy that they're a red light. Is it still doable to do like micro doses of stuff so yeah. they can sort of collect wins and gradually work towards where they want to go? Where it's not like, for anyone's this, it is challenging because you've created these movement patterns over years and years and years and years. And years. So they're habitual and subconscious, like anything. Behavior change and even movement change, it takes like constant repetition. So I wanted to loop back to the daily thing. The reason why it's daily is it actually is way easier on your willpower and your brain if you say daily. It sounds like an oxymoron, but when people, when you're doing stuff for yourself at home, it is 100% easier to agree to yourself that you've got to do it daily. Much easier than saying, I'm going to do it two or three days a week. Right. Because it allows you to start building the habitual practice of putting it into your day. You schedule it and you just do it. If it's two or three days a week, your brain sees what happens on the days you don't do it and thinks all this free time you got and it thinks this is good. And then it wants you to keep doing that. It wants you to keep doing nothing or whatever it is you did in that free time rather than this new thing, which is challenging at the start, which will end up being enjoyable anyway, because you feel better but at the start. It's so much easier to do it every day, which is cool when you said that, because I wanted to ham that home it was like. For your brain and your willpower, save yourself energy and just do it every day. Whatever it is you're trying to change, just say, I'm going to do this every day. That way, if you yeah. fall off once, it's only six out of seven. Fall off twice, it's five out of seven. It's still better. Two or three days a week, you fall off once, it's two. Fall off twice, it's once. And your whole week's shot. 
great. So I like that idea of it. And then don't even ask about the red light thing. Nearly everyone falls into a red light. We know everybody at some stage falls into a red light. There's this like a component where it's like, if you're really cooked and you, you can just do this and you still collect the win and come back. Yeah. To the groundwork. Yeah. Which will make a lot more sense. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to share here that's, I, that I think dives into people being red lights and how we can build, um, the, the groundwork will do two things. One is it's going to put you in those positions that are going to be coding you towards making mm -hmm. your body feel better and move better. But two, it puts you on the ground. So whether you're inside or outside, um, the, you know, it's not called grounding for a reason, but it does have this parasympathetic, parasympathetic effect, meaning, um, for anybody, it, it's part of your nervous system that is like the calming part of your nervous system, um, or the down regulating, if you will. So what we always find is, uh, you know, when you're on the floor and you're going through these movements and you get a lot more familiar with them, um, there's a whole slew of things that happen. You, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, you, when what I've seen is, uh, people just become more relaxed. Um, they're, they're, they're doing more of that grounding. They're, they're able to be in touch with their body and be inside their body, which is something that I think is rare these days when people are actually super present inside their body. Um, um, but yeah, it, the, the short answer to your question is yes, the groundwork is always available to people because you can literally do it anywhere. Um, it could be the first thing you do when you roll out of bed. It could be the last thing you do before you go to bed. Um, you know, it's just, you know, there, there, what's interesting is that, and I don't know why this came up right now, but there, there are some coaches that have actually gotten rid of the couches in their house and mm. the only resting positions that they can do are, are going to be like the, the, on your, uh, on your knees and like sitting back on your heels. And if you can't do that, um, I've actually made, um, little stools that like props you up a little bit. So yeah, that yeah. when you sit on the stool and you don't crush your ankles, cause that can be uncomfortable for people. But yeah, ultimately, um, if you're red light, there's, uh, the, the, the groundwork positions are always available to you. Is that similar to, mm, I can't remember his name. He was an Aussie guy, the resting positions, just like 15 of them. Something like that. I can't remember his name. He was a chiropractor. You might know him. Beach or something. Anyway. I don't. I'll find yeah. out later, but the, he had all these resting poses and there was a big, a whole bunch of them. And yeah, he talked about, yeah, resting on your knees, rock, sitting back on your ankles. I'm the same. Like I get talking in the cat, I want to get rid of the couch because I can see it in, so like Theo, he just gets on the couch and he just squirms. He can't sit still on it. Yeah. When he is on the floor and finds a position, he can sort of hold in there and yeah. be focused on whatever we're doing. Um, and the more and more we're looking into this stuff we're learning with autism and that, they more like, there's things I'm just, I'm noticing that they talk about, like the kid struggles to eat at the dinner table because of autism and they struggle to eat certain foods, do it on the floor, do it in the bath, do it in all these different positions, different areas, mainly for the fun thing. But in my head, I'm like, it's just get them away from the chair yeah. on the ground. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So yeah, now go. So there some of the rest, just real quick, some of the resting positions are going to be, um, so where you're on like both knees and just mm. sitting back like this and being in your chain. Um, the other one, and what's really interesting is you see the kids do this, right? Yeah. You see the kids do this. So the other one is they have one knee down and one knee up like this. This chair isn't really suitable for this. Yeah, but that's, uh, you know, uh, they're just hanging out in this position. We yeah. Call yeah. It like the, I think we called it like the cowboy position, but they're usually in this position. Um, and they're playing with something in front of them. But it's really it's fascinating for anyone listening, watch children and the way that they rest. Mm. Um, and most of them, um, it, it tends to be more younger. Uh, some of the girls will do the W and we really try to avoid that. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah. when you watch a lot of kids, they're already doing these resting positions. And this is what Coach Gilly, this is why he started thinking about this being this innate movement behavior. Because like, well, why are the kids? Why are the why are the kids making these shapes with their bodies um, to rest in? Yeah, pretty cool. This is a and, he's, and he's taken all sorts of information from. I have some books back here, but um, I'll have to get like the list of them. Like, uh, I don't know if it was Muscle and Meridians, but I know uh, there's been some really uh, cool people out there that he considers teachers that have taught him a lot about um, the back, the importance of the back chain, and things like that. So. 
That's cool. So if someone wants to get an assessment, because I know I've got to wrap up for another call in a yeah. bit, how can they do that? What's the yeah, best way of doing it? Yeah, reach out to me either through like the, my Instagram um, or Facebook and then just send me a message. We could talk about what it is that, you know, because the other thing too is I want to make sure I'm screening people because if you, not that we can't help people with like meniscal tears or or even mm. like labral tears and things like that, we can certainly help them. Um, but I would also want to make sure that you're not, um, I don't want to say like at the point of like surgery, because I do, I still truly believe that we can help a lot of people, even if they have these torn things. Um, the reason why I bring this up and why I think this system is so important is because when you take a look at um, Eric Goodman, two or three weeks ago, he's the founder um, of foundation training. Okay. Mm. He posted a video of his MRI and it was garbage to be honest with you. Like he had like anterior uh, disc herniations, which is like rare. I mean, it was just garbage. And this guy is pain-free. He's yeah. relatively pain-free. Now, uh, Coach Gilly is like, I think he's pushing 60 now. Um, it, he, I, saw, I saw his x-ray and literally there was like no disc space between the bottom three, like the space between the bottom three vertebrae. Like it had collapsed. There was like nothing there. Granted, I understand it's not an MRI and I couldn't see the, the health of the disc. But when you see that there's like no spacing there, there's a problem. And when I went so on down to New Orleans, uh, that was, he had the picture of it up on the wall. And I said, whose is this? And he was like, that's mine. And I was like, no way. I was like, because looking at a spine like that, I would have been like, this guy is screwed. Um, but he, he was golfing four days a week. And he was at the time, this was probably six, seven years ago. He was doing like two to three triathlons a summer and he was doing them relative pain free. Yeah, right. So, so all that to say, to summarize, when we have these changes in our joints and in our spine and our and whatever, there's there, it's a, it's possible to be pain free if you're moving the right way. Yes. Which is cool. I like it. So reach out to Todd, be just like, I think it'd just be good to have a conversation around it if you're if you're an athlete all those thousand listeners we have you want to move better and have more longevity because i'm going to touch base with you again and ask this basically about rebuilding my body after the season and just going really? through that motion again which is what i want to do anyway it's what i tend to do after the season every year and then yeah i might even share as we do in it just yeah it's promise so people can see what it's all about that'll be fun what it'll what it would look like but yeah like and subscribe follow us everywhere do all the cool shit but reach out to Todd and get in contact with him about trying to get even if it's just the assessment and the, the conversation with you about it and then that'd be just eye opening in itself I reckon yeah I know we didn't talk about what you're doing right now but yeah I think we do that next week okay we cool. can wrap, do it next week and see what my goals are up until the end of the year awesome Sweet. And the, uh, I know we're signing off the last thing I'll say is you know working I work with people in chronic pain in my office and I, and I, you know, I worked for a company called Active Life um, where we program for people all over the world to get out of pain and through all of my research and through, you know, just working on myself and helping other people, um, it's the best system I've seen. Um, and I hate to call it a system. And the reason why it even lands more for me is because there's something that I, I was inspired by that made a lot of sense, which is called dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. And it's these positions that you see infants um basically what it what it is is your you know your pediatrician is using like these uh, milestones these movement milestones to make sure that your kid is developing at, at a certain rate and when you look at what Di dns put together is they put together this whole rehab based off of the movement pattern so what i find to be really interesting is like there's a whole another school of thought which is similar right mm. that we have this innate movement pattern and that when we can get back to these we're going to be feeling better so um yeah, anyways. Nah, I like it. It's good. All right, everybody. Tune right. next week. We might share what I'm doing. Yeah. For the summer. Australian summer, anyway. All right, guys. Australian. See you. Bye. Yeah, man, that was cool. Yeah, I'm keen.